Okay. Did you all get a some kind of sign saying that it's a recording? Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> all right. Well, welcome everyone uh, for this our first care forum of 2023. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming out to this event. Uh, I'm Dan Inkster. I am uh, from the University of Houston, and I direct the Elizabeth D. Rockwell Center on Ethics and Leadership, which sponsors these lectures. I'm hosting today's event, but I want to acknowledge uh, the other members of the CARE Forum Advisory Board, including Joan Tronto, Asha Bandari, and Lina Murillo. Uh, as you'll see on the screen here, uh, we've got a number of events scheduled for the spring, so uh, I can send those out after this event, uh, but, but you, know, you might also know we have these events. Uh, our next one is February 24th, then March 10th, and then uh, April 28th. I, th I think we're probably booked for the rest of the semester, but if you're interested in presenting next year, please send me or Joan or Asha or Lena an email. Uh, just say, hey, I, you know, I have this paper. Uh, I'm interested. Uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of books, but it doesn't have to be a book, right? Uh, actually, um, there's a lot of interest in, in uh, hearing presentations from people who have works in progress, papers, articles, things like that. So, so if you have something, just let us know. Um, and uh, we'll take it under consideration. Um, uh, I also want to mention here, let me change my screen share here. Uh, I want to mention this event on Monday that uh, Joan brought to my attention. Uh, here it is, uh, Tatiana Thielen, Care in the State. Um, uh, I don't know, Joan, I don't know if you have anything else you want to, to say about this event, but it looks very interesting and just, uh, you know, uh, I also, just, I guess I just want to say if, if you all have events, uh, know about care related events that you want to send me, um, you know, I'm happy to advertise them and also we can post them on our webpage. You know, ideally we, we have this vision that we'll have a, a care forum page and we can list all kinds of events that are happening across the country and world, uh, just uh, so that it makes it easy and everyone can keep up with with uh, this rapidly growing field, uh, um, and uh, so so please you know please send those to me too. Uh, Joan, did you want to say anything more about this event? Uh, I met Tatiana Taylor a long time ago. She's been working on this project about care in the state for a long time, and she has a group of international students who have been working with her, focusing both on Eastern Europe and parts of the rest of the world. So it'll be worth probably hearing what she has to say. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that sounds that sounds super interesting. Uh, okay, so uh, enough with the preliminaries. Now to our main event. Our presenter today is Justin Clardy, Assistant Professor in the Department of Philosophy at Santa Clara University. Professor Clardy's research focuses on normative questions that arise within the context of interpersonal relationships and political theories, with special attention to questions about social justice and emotions such as love, sympathy, compassion, and tenderness. His recent work has invest investigated the intersection of love and race, non-monogamous relationships, and the unjust political costs for non-monogamists. His work has appeared in Hypatia, the Journal of Black Sexuality and Relationships, as well as other journals and edited books. Uh, and his talk today will be addressing uh, this topic of his recent work, Black Polyamory and Civic Tenderness. Professor Clardy will start today's session with uh, about a 20 to 25 minute presentation, and then we'll open the floor to questions and discussion. Uh, please, uh, let's use the raise hand function if you have a question, or you can signal to me, uh, or I mean, you can enter something in the chat, but uh, probably the raise hand function uh, is the easiest one uh, to keep track of. And that, that should be uh, at the bottom of your screen. I want to thank Professor Clardy for being with us today, and I want to thank you all for uh, who are in attendance for coming out, and I'm going to hand things over. I'm very excited for this talk, so thank you. All right, thank you for that that very warm welcome and introduction, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, is there a way that I could share my screen with you all? Well, of course. Yeah, here. Uh, what do I have to do? There we go. All right, it should be yours. Let's see. Ah, okay, yes, yes, there we go. Um, oh, wow. Give me, oh, wow. Um, one second. 
I'm having some technical difficulties with the screen share. Uh, is it on my end or? Uh, it, may, it, it, may, it may be on mine. I'm going to check now. Uh, ah, well, yeah, it says that I'd have to sort of sign out and sign back in in order to uh, share my screen. Is, is that okay if I, if I sign out and sign right back in? Sure. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry for this. Okay. All right, while we wait, anyone have a topic for discussion or announcements about uh, things that are going on around uh, the world uh, in, uh, with care ethics? Interesting things. Anyone about to publish something on care ethics they want to tell us about? Read something interestingly on uh, interesting on care ethics recently. I'm yes. going to be a. Priya? Yeah, Eva was saying something, so I can wait. No, I, I, nothing important. I was just saying, going to say that I'm going to be zooming in at a. Uh, a there's a group. I don't know if you know about it. Uh, um, Daniel at uh, at uh, Texas A and M that's uh, looking at care. Really? Uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Interdisciplinary group. Um, so I'm going to be talking at that only in Zoom, however. <laughs> wow. there. But just letting you know. But go ahead, Priya. Yeah. So I have a paper coming in Hypatia. Uh, so I'm just waiting for it to come out and I'll be then whenever so this year we are booked. So maybe next year I would then uh, share my thoughts. It is based on my doctoral work. Uh, it's a co-authored paper with one of my supervisors where I use care ethics to look at uh, recent ban on surrogacy in India, on commercial surrogacy in India. So I've used care ethics for that. So yeah. And some more projects, but I see that our uh, speaker is back in. So yeah. Uh, let me congratulate you. Uh, congratulations on your your uh, publication. Thank you. Uh, and, and also, I'll send the congratulations on that as well. Uh, thank you guys for sort of allowing me back in. Um, and it does look like I am able to share my screen. Uh, so I'll try to, in the interest of time, dive right into it. Uh, it might seem like I'm flying through some of these slides. And uh, I think that anything I may leave unaddressed uh, in the context of the talk, um, I, I'm happy to sort of discuss in Q&A. Um, and I'll share my screen now. Okay. So today, um, I'm going to be talking with you all about civic tenderness and marriage reform. Um, it, it, this comes from selected sections from a manuscript that I have in progress titled Love Hates Us, which looks at uh, race and non-monogamies in the American context. Um, so that larger, that larger project seeks to answer a couple of, of larger questions, and I've listed those here. Um, those questions include how are racialized subjects such as Black people in polyamorous relationships positioned along multiple axes of oppression? What kind of capital, financial, social, political, or cultural is able to be mobilized by non-monogamous relationships among Blacks? How much of racial justice involves the liberation of Black non-monogamists? What are the penalties and privileges that accompany race, gender, and sexuality in polyamorous living and identifying? How are the experiences of pleasure and danger differentiated? Uh, not only by race and gender, but also by, rom by romantic relationality. How, in other words, are differences politicized in non-monogamous relationships? Uh, and so a brief roadmap, I, I wanna kind of allow those questions to operate in the backdrop of some of the information um, I'll be sharing with you all today. Um, and this is a little bit of a roadmap for uh, today's talk. Um, I'll talk very briefly about uh, civic tenderness. Um, and now we'll move into sort of how uh, scholars of marriage have thought about marriage in sort of the context of liberalism. Um, and then we'll think about why does marriage need reform on my view, uh, which involves presenting the sort of truncated history of American marriage. Uh, and then I'll handle some objections and responses. I know this might seem like a lot to squeeze in in 30 minutes, but we'll do the best that we can. So uh, for, I've for a while been developing this idea of civic tenderness, which uh, is a public emotion. Uh, it's, it's a caring public emotion. 
And I think that civic tenderness is a sort of response to what writers uh, in care ethics have called civic vulnerability or situational vulnerability. Situational vulnerability is the sort of vulnerability mediated by social, political, or social geographical context. So sort of in addition to sort of our material vulnerabilities, sort of this need for food and drink and shelter and the like, um, societies play a role in mediating what like just how vulnerable uh, someone is uh, in a particular society. Um, and it also, civic tenderness combats uh, this, this notion of civic indifference. Uh, which I've listed here, uh, it's, it's the sort of lack of an appropriate concern uh, of a society's members or institutions or systems might have toward a person's or group's vulnerability or situational vulnerability. And on my view, uh, civic tenderness is a response to this vulnerability. Um, and I've developed uh, this notion of civic tenderness against the backdrop of the work of thinkers like Martha Nussbaum, who talk about sort of public emotion, the public emotion of compassion, and characterizes compassion as a response to a perceived suffering. The intervention that I take tenderness to be making is that instead of responding to a perceived suffering, it's responding to a perceived vulnerability. Um, insofar as vulnerability precedes suffering, uh, on my view, tenderness precedes compassion, right? Uh, so that's a sort of very quick and ready uh, way of understanding the framework uh, that I'm sort of operating within. Now, when it comes to sort of how thinkers have thought about American marriage in the context of political liberalism, uh, there's a lot of appeals to a couple of things, uh, liberal neutrality on the one hand and public reason on the other. Uh, some thinkers will say that uh, liberal neutrality requires the state to remain neutral between the various conceptions of flourishing that its citizens have. Uh, it cannot hold or appeal to any particular view to justify its laws, policies, or intuitions. Uh, sorry, institutions, sorry. Uh, and then public reason, on the other hand, right, these are reasons that uh, one could reasonably expect others with different conceptions of flourishing, drawn from perhaps different political commitments or different commitments to moral or religious doctrines uh, to accept. And so th this is sort of drawn directly from sort of the lineage of Rawls, right, Rawlsian thought, this idea that public institutions need to be uh, liberally neutral, so they shouldn't be sort of making any uh, partialistic uh, um, I don't know, evaluations towards certain people or groups based on comprehensive beliefs. Uh, and then public reasons, the reasons that we offer to justify those institutions uh, should be reasons that uh, uh, members of our society who perhaps think about the world differently than us uh, can accept. Um, uh, in my reading, uh, not too many people have made uh, mention of Rawls's different pr difference principle in thinking about marriage, which reads, uh, the inequalities in a society are permissible only in the case that they're to the greatest benefit of the least advantage and the worst off. Um, and sort of drawing both on the difference principle a little bit and sort of the work of Charles Mills and how Charles Mills works uh, within the context of liberalism, uh, particularly thinking about his work on race and racial liberalism, um, I do think that the difference principle comes into finer relief when we're thinking about American marriage in the context of uh, black relationships, whether monogamous or non-monogamous, but I am dealing here with the context of black non-monogamists. Uh, some examples, um, Tamara Metz and Claire Chambers have uh, made this appeal to marriage as violating liberal neutrality. Uh, on Metz's view, uh, marriage is a comprehensive social institution uh, it confers an ethical status to marital relationships, and therefore marriage should be abolished. Um, and, and Metz sort of compares marriage to kind of like uh, the celebration of quinceañeras or sweet sixteens, and says that, you know that the state should not be endorsing these types of uh, cultural uh, celebrations, um, and so marriage ought to be abolished. Chambers takes a little bit of a different route to the same conclusion that marriage should be abolished, and Chambers says that marriage includes the acquisition of a specific legal status and a bundle of legal rights. Uh, and privileges, and that it falsely assumes that all the most important needs are met within uh, the context of a marriage, and therefore marriage should be abolished. Um, other thinkers in the context of liberalism, uh, like Elizabeth Brake, have pointed out that uh, American marriage is uh, unduly discriminatory, um, and this is where we get uh, the coining of her term, a model normativity, that talks about uh, the discriminations marriage makes against other caring relationships that deviate from this monogamous two-person heteronormative uh, aiming toward marriage standard. 
but break doesn't go as break doesn't go as far as say Metz and Chambers in arguing that marriage should be abolished. Break goes uh, a different route and says that marriage could be reformed to be made uh, less discriminatory and sort of meet the principles required of it by liberalism um, if it were to adopt a minimal marriage, right? Uh, and we can talk about this concept of minimal marriage, but Brake believes uh, that this uh, concept of minimal marriage is the most extensive set of rights and benefits that the state could endorse. Um, and another key idea about uh, minimal marriage is that it disaggregates what currently exists as a bundle of rights and privileges that is exchanged to only one person. And it disaggregates those rights and privileges and allows us to sort of share them with, I guess, you know, as many persons as we can, lest those, uh, lest those rights be exhausted, right? Um, we can talk again more about that. Um, so what I'd like to talk uh, about over the next couple of slides uh, are some claims that I'm making. Um, and this is in no particular order. Uh, the, uh, what I have listed here at the top is bans on plural marriage today are rel relics of a 19th century view that racialized, stigmatized, and subjugated intimate relationship styles that deviated from monogamy. Um, I'm also wanting to establish that in upholding a monogamous condition uh, that has been inherited from a legacy of white supremacy, the present form of marriage is integrally and persistently involved in race-based systems of oppression. Uh, and also, uh, Black polyamorous who desire to be treated as equals under civil marriage are denied equal right to choose the kinds of relationships, intimate caring relationships that will make their life go best. This is where we get to a truncated history of non-monogamy in America. So uh, historically, American resistance to marriage has been racist and anti-Black. Um, some black, some non-monogamous unions were actually created by the domestic slave trade. So here, uh, when slaves were chattel and be, would be traded off, uh, it's well documented how that disrupted uh, family units. Um, and sometimes in these contexts, when slaves would find themselves on a new plantation, um, they would be they would find different uh, subjects of their affection. Um, and sometimes because women's uh, wombs were treated as land gapes, as ways to increase a plantation's slave holdings, sometimes these uh, persons were just pair bonded, told to sort of copulate and procreate. Um, even though they might have come from a plantation where they had a, a, a well-established marriage prior to it, right? And so we see the ways that non-monogamies were created by the domestic slave trade. Um, historical archives reveal that some of these Black non-monogamies were consensual. And I, I have an asterisk here because it's an open question whether or not uh, this, a Black sentient being, uh, marked as Chattel, is the kind of thing that could consent. So even when we sort of see the sort of newly developing affectionate relationships on new plantations and things like that, that seems like the parties to the relationship are in accord with, and they're maybe like not under the coercion of a master. Um, it seems like those are consensual, but I, I, I sort of reserve uh, a commitment to that claim until I settle the question of what I think about Chattel and, and its ability to consent. Um, and then we also see that the American disregard for Black non-monogamous non -monogamous families is well documented. Here uh, in the slide, I have listed a couple of different Black histories of marriage uh, that I definitely recommend uh, picking up if you haven't taken a look at them. Tara Hunter's Bound in Wedlock is an excellent work. Uh, Black Women, Black Love by, Ann, by Diane Stewart is also an excellent work. Uh, and then Till Death Do Us Part as well. So uh, in a paper uh, by Martha Ertman uh, titled Race Treason in the, Unstold, in the Untold Story of America's Ban on Polygamy, um, she argues that at the time um, that plural marriage was being considered in the United States, uh, Utah was an independent state sort of seeking inclusion into the union. Um, and the ways that the United States resisted Mormon inclusion uh, was to sort of uh, satirize, stigmatize sort of this Mormon practice of um, uh, polygamy. Now, uh, they... According to Erdman, the United States saw Mormons as committing two separate acts of treason, the first being sort of operating a theocratic government, right, sort of one that sort of follows the tradition of the, the religion, uh, but the other is sort of like being engaged in these practices that were uh, odious in uh, amongst the northern and western nations of Europe and almost exclusively a feature of the life of Asiatic and African peoples, right? So they sort of saw them as betraying whiteness uh, as well. Um, in this image here, Uncle Sam's troublesome bedfellows, and the, the next image that you'll see, uh, the elder's happy home, uh, 
you, these images were published at the time that the Reynolds case, uh, which is sort of the present the, the case of precedent that the United States denies plural marriage on, and this is this happens uh, late in the 1800s, and the United States has not revisited a case on plural marriage since then. Uh, as the time of that opinion, the Reynolds opinion was coming out. These images were published uh, in popular uh, magazines uh, at the time, and you can kind of see both in this image the ways that Asian Black folks, uh, Mormons are depicted. The Mormon here is uh, out on the bottom left of your screen, clutching a paper that says polygamy, being kicked out of the bed by Uncle Sam, and being labeled as a troublesome bedfellow, bedfellow as well as the sort of caricatured images of other racialized subjects. Um, and also in this, uh, The Elder's Happy Home, you see the white patriarch uh, in the top right of the screen uh, in a series of rambunctious wives, right? Um, and the, the patriarch is doing nothing, but in the bottom left of the screen, you see a, a one single black baby in the cradle, right? But no black mothers, uh, which I think, in, of course, insinuates a, a rape of some sort uh, in this context. But we, we, we have no explanation of how this black baby got there, what it's doing there. Uh, and it sort of completes the suggestion that polygamy, uh, once blackened, is chaotic and creates a scene of chaos, right? Um, and sort of these racialized images were employed as a way of resisting uh, plural marriage uh, in, in, in his time. Um, so Kim Tallbear uh, has also written at length about monogamies and its colonial history, um, and has argued that monogamy and the nuclear family have been cent central to uh, the project of settler colonialism. Uh, and what we see uh, both in these images uh, and what Ertman argues is that uh, according to the United States rationales that emerged from the Reynolds opinion is that Mormon passage into whiteness must first pass through monogamy, right? And so we sort of see whiteness and monogamy paired here uh, in, a, in a particular kind of way. Um, so returning so this is going to be like the segment where we kind of talk a little bit about this history of Black non-monogamies and its sort of situation with American marriage before transitioning finally into civic tenderness. Um, so uh, in Diane Stewart's Black Women, Black Love, uh, she characterizes the ways, one, that Black non-monogamies were created by the slave trade, but also the ways that poly affections, sort of simultaneous affections uh, for multiple parties were possible, right? And we have this quote here from Laura's husband, which reads, uh, please get married as long as I am married. It was never our wishes to be separated from one another. It was never our fault. The woman is not born that feels as near to me as you do. You feel this day like myself, Laura. I think of you and my children every day of my life. Laura, I do love you the same. My love to you have never failed. Laura, truly, I've got another wife, and I very, I'm very sorry for that, I am. You seems and feels to me as much of my loving wife as you ever did. And also, uh, so one, I think we see the sort of existence of polyaffectivity, right? There's still this sort of ongoing affection for his first wife, Laura, even in the presence of having acquired this second wife. Um, and, you know, in this letter to Laura, he's also requesting that she send him locks of their children's hair so that he can enact sort of Black spiritualistic practices of protection over them, even at a distance, um, which I think speaks to of course, later on in American history, this notion of the absent Black father as sort of being a nonchalant, non-caring sort of uh, ab abandoner, right? Even in contexts where economic circumstance or simply the, the, the circumstance of the domestic slave trade separated Black uh, men from their families, uh, there were still sort of a, a kind of affection uh, being desired or shown to sort of, uh, that I think marks a kind of presence. Um, and this is a, a this is one instance. And also, uh, Stewart uh, has another quote, which I think is sort of a re really really uh, informative. She says, uh, "Other uh, she says unexpected love triangles and other prickly scenarios presented themselves in the immediate post-war years for many. In some instances, black women resolve such surprises by choosing to remain married to the same man, not necessarily as co-wives, but as co-mothers." After months of making her way from Alabama to South Carolina to be reunited with her husband and some of her children lost to her through the domestic slave trade, Dorcas Cooper was satisfied to remain in a polygamous relationship when she recognized how well her husband's new wife had taken care of her children. Cooper, in fact, liked her husband's second wife, Jenny, and would not let anybody say anything against her. The two women resided comfortably in the same house uh, with their spouse until Cooper passed away, right? And so again, we sort of see 
uh, the context of cooperation in the context of multiple spouses, um, even in sort of the antebellum South, as well as uh, shortly thereafter, uh, the Civil War. Now, after the Civil War, right, the ways that uh, some historians write and talk about uh, the, the Freedmen's Bureau is almost that they're the, as if they are these sort of beneficent uh, actors in, in sort of helping naturalize or make citizens of uh, Black uh, relationships. Um, they, they paint state officials as benevolent actors uh, in the expansion of marriage rights, right? So now we have slavery is over, Blacks can now marry because they've acquired the right to contract. Um, but there were these non-monogamous dynamics that we now have to think about what to do with, not just non-monogamous dynamics by way of romantic relationships, but non-monogamous dynamics by way of family and the sort of care, caretaking relationships that existed. And the Freedmen's Bureau is in many ways forcing these Black family dynamics to fit under this non or sorry, under this monogamous framework, right? Because the primary interest of the state was to relieve itself of as many wards, uh, as many children that the state would have to uh, take care of via sort of social programming as it could. And so there are a record of Freedmen's Bureau agents saying things like, uh, whenever, say, a Black man or woman appears to me with more than one spouse with equal claim uh, onto him or her, I marry them to the one that has the, the least, uh, or sorry, the most amount of dependent children that would otherwise become charges upon the state, right? And so we sort of see this interest uh, in this push toward marriage, which seems like, oh, you know, Blacks can now marry, let's, let's get them married and like, you know, naturalize the citizenship process. But it was a complete disregard for the, the dynamics uh, both created uh, by uh, the slave trade uh, and sort of that were emerging shortly after the Civil War. Um, uh, bureau agents believed that any arrangement that deviated from monogamy contaminated marriage while positioning Black women and children to become state dependents, right? And so this was something that they wanted to uh, avoid as best they could. Uh, and so in my view, um, in upholding a monogamous condition that has been inherited, inherited from a legacy of white supremacy, the present form of marriage is integrally and persistently involved in a race-based system of, of, of oppression. We have not revisited a case um, at the federal level on plural marriage since uh, the late 1800s, even as we've seen sort of pushes for same-sex marriage and sort of new emerging concern about what is the future of same-sex marriage uh, given a conservative court and the overturning in the Dobbs decision. Um, like people are like well, in a frenzy, like what might happen to same-sex marriage? Um, and I think that, you know, I've been thinking recently about that, and I'm happy to kind of maybe think more about that uh, with you all uh, in the Q&A. Um, but yeah, even 2015 at Oberfeld v. Hodges, uh, Obama comes out and says love wins, right, because we get same-sex marriage. Uh, but again, what about same-sex relationships that exist in non-monogamous relationships? What about non-monogamous relationships of opposite sex, so on and so forth? So love winning, uh, I think, is contentious. Uh, on my view, bans on plural marriage today are relics of a 19th century view that racialized, stigmatized, and subjugated intimate relationships, intimate caring relationships that deviated from monogamy. Um, and so on. because of this, I think that uh, marriage has created and sustained material disadvantage that material disadvantages that are race-based sort of things around uh, how caretaking relationships are able to protect themselves. Uh, by using by utilizing state resources. Uh, so like what who what or who gets to count as a family, for example. Um, but uh, also excuse me, uh, by sort of like uh, mediating what or who gets to count uh, as a family. Um, but it also makes us rethink sort of like the difference principle, right, and the sort of situational vulnerabilities that marriage creates and sustains for polyamorous, other non-monogamous uh, within this context by not allowing them access or participation into the institution of marriage. Um, I think in the Black context, that kind of constraint on, say, things like upward economic mobility um, are things that are not just race neutral, um, but they are race specific. And I think that we should think about, talk about and address them um, as such, right? Uh, and so that is how I take sort of my rationale to differ from those on offer by thinkers like Metz, Chambers and Brake, right? Who are saying, oh, this is undue discrimination or you know, it violates the liberal principle. I'm saying, yeah, 
sure, it does do those things, right? But it also kind of creates and sustains this material disadvantage of those who are already situationally vulnerable in American society. Um, and that seems to be a straightforward violation of the difference principle as well. Um, so from this point, I want to sort of think uh, out loud about uh, the question of people ask, well, how do we get there from here, right? Um, and this is where I think this program uh, or this, this, this context of civic tenderness emerges. Um, this appropriate orientation of concern that is responsible to the vulnerability that is created and sustained by marriage um, and sort of provides its impulse toward caregiving behavior as I take civic tenderness to be both cognitive and effective. Um, and how we might cultivate uh, that disposition in a society's members, institutions, and systems uh, is sort of how I think about this process that I call tenderization, which involves the expansion of tenderness um, throughout the systems, members, and institutions by raising the awareness of the ways that these members or groups are vulnerable. Um, I think that this talk uh, does that in many ways, um, but I also think um, that, you know, you know, uh, mass media has a way to, to a role to play in this sort of uh, elected officials, uh, the ways we're sort of thinking about marriage at local as well as federal as well as global levels all has a, have a role to play in this tenderization process. Um, okay, yeah. And other common uh, objections that I've encountered is sort of like abolition uh, or reform. So why not abolition? If we're saying that race is involved, I'm sorry, if we're saying that marriage is involved in this persistent uh, racist, race-based system of oppression, why not abolish it? Um, I think that the material inequalities that Black polyamorous experience are present and persistent. So I favor a view uh, of minimal marriage that sees it as a part of a reparative scheme for righting the wrongs incurred by Black polyamorous. In other words, Minimal marriage would in part work to rectify past state discrimination, both symbolically and materially. Uh, thus, I am inclined to understand minimal marriage as a, pro as a project engaged in building a better social order. Uh, one where the cost of building a more equitable world should be distributed more to those who have inherited the moral and political liabilities of the past and ongoing injustices. So for me, I think marriage must remain as a way of uh, enlisting itself in this scheme of reparations due to those who have been historically ex excluded and marginalized by that institution. Um, and minimal marriage, the framework here, um, is one that I am utilizing because the relationships that I think have been sort of unduly discriminated against have been these intimate caring relationships that have taken non-monogamous form amongst Black folks in particular in this project. Um, and another uh, common objection is um, pretty much do polyamorous even desire uh, plural marriage, right? There are some folks who say that, you know, relationship anarchists uh, represent a kind of non-monogamy and they actively resist uh, inclusion into the institution of marriage because uh, they believe a more transformative, a more radical politic is available to them by rejecting or resisting participation or inclusion um, into that institution. Um, and I respond to that sort of by saying, you know, the, that the class of polyamorous does not universally desire marriage protection poses no challenge to the push toward minimal marriage any more than the fact that not all monogamous desire to marry does. It instead meets the requirements of liberalism to extend equal opportunity for accessing the institution and its bundles of rights, privileges, and so on to those polyamorous who do desire the legal protections that marriage affords. Um, and with that, I will conclude this talk uh, and sort of open the floor for us to think uh, together. I don't know how I did on time, Dan. I hope uh, I hope we're okay. You did great. That was great. You okay. a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, great content there in a, in a short amount of time. So very nicely done. Uh, yeah. So the the floor is open to questions. Uh, if you go to the reactions button, it's at the bottom of my screen. You can. You can uh, raise a hand, and I think you'll you'll jump to the top of the order, and I'll see you. Uh, I don't have everyone on the screen here, so um, uh, that's easiest to do. Uh, scrolling through here, people. All right. Well, uh, while we're waiting, uh, in, in, you know, for for other questions, uh, Justin, I I'll get the ball rolling here. Okay, sounds good. Dan. 
Oh, somebody has one? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm on a phone. I can't see oh. the reaction buttons. This is Tamara Metz. Yes. And and un, I also unfortunately have to run to an administrative meeting in a few minutes. So I'm just going to jump in. Please. Yes. <laughs> um, um, so first of all, I just want to say, Justin, this argument is so compelling and important. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, you, um, yeah, have illuminated and extended, I think, you know, the work that you referred to um, in, and, and, and the insights and arguments of that work in such important ways. So, yay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my, I guess the question I have is something about, um, or it's just a hunch about the thinking about how this interacts so with um, our current historical, social, political uh, context, which as some of you know, I like to call neoliberalism. Um, and I'm going to toss out the concern and just hear your response um, that attaching that that marriage, the symbolic as well as the material and institutional legal, is so caught up in uh, making this the wider system work mm -hmm. why not just get rid why not just something else that you know um emphasizes tenderness mm. valorizes tenderness both intimately and publicly mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. and i'm going to take the answer i'm going to shut myself down, take the answer, and then run off. But thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think that that's a, a, a really good and important question, Tamara, and thanks, thank you for it. Um, yeah, so the neoliberalist worry, right, that this, this idea uh, that sort of inclusion of sort of more people into this institution doesn't necessarily change the, the nature of the kinds of unjust uh, discriminations the institution makes. It just makes more of them differently or something like that, right? Um, I, I mean, I do think that uh, there are some reasons that the institution uh, should exist to protect relationships that are at least presumptively permanent. Uh, and I do think that that is sort of one of the distinctions about the kind of caring relationship that marriages are uh, it involves their sort of this, this presumed uh, permanence that these relationships uh, would have. Um, and I think that, you know, do I think that the society has other work to do by way of uh, repairing other institutions that are in place and supposedly geared toward supporting caring relationships? Oh, absolutely. Um, however, I don't know that sort of this argument for expanding marriage's inclusion in the ways that I'm uh, advocating for denies the need for that work. Uh, and so I guess for me, um, yeah, I think because of, I guess, that presumptive permanence, the kinds of caring relationships that we'd, we're we likely to see within the context of relationship that make this declaration um, will differ in kind a little bit uh, and yeah, I don't know, should sort of, uh, be protected, uh, in that regard. Uh, but for me, keeping marriage around definitely is more primarily for enlisting it in this process of sort of reparations and sort of like not moving the goalpost, right? There's this history of sort of like black inclusion, for example, in the American society, such that, you know, when blacks get included uh, into some institution mm -hmm. or other, the goalposts are just kind of pushed a little bit further back. And we're kind of saying, well, you know, well, mm -hmm. honestly, you know, that's kind of not a thing anymore. You know, I think mm -hmm. that this happened with the institution of slavery, for example. And I, and I, I wonder whether or not abolishing marriage in a moment's notice uh, leaves black polyamorous out to dry in similar ways, kind of 
acting as if, you know, okay, we're going to be better going forward. Uh, mm -hmm. But the sort of acknowledgement of these historical wrongs that the, that the institution has been uh, uh, enlisted in kind of just, I don't know, goes away. Um, yep. So yeah, I, I'm wary of that. Yep. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Virginia, do you have a question? I saw you just. Oh, you're still muted. I'm still muted? No, you're oh. on. I can hear you now. Yeah, you're good. Sorry, I'm so slow with these things. <laughs> um, that was extremely interesting. And um, I'll just have to think about it because I don't. I don't immediately see how this connects with the values of care ethics and um, whether whether it is, um, I don't know, more consistent or, or more of a challenge to those values. But I certainly want to think about it. And thank you. It was extremely interesting. Thank you for that. Thank That's you for, it for me. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, I think that one of the connections, uh, and not as a way of sort of like uh, taking a question, but perhaps maybe making a little bit more of a clarification, um, is that I do think that uh, the kinds of relationships that non-monogamous relationships are, at least polyamorous ones, as I'm conceiving of them, um, involve sort of things like caretaking and care work, sort of thinking about uh, the age old adage of it takes a community to raise a child within the black community uh, or within black communities, I should say, um, given economic marginalization, uh, what we've often of, often seen historically is, you know, both parents working outside the household, uh, which has enlisted other community members in, say, the, the, the practice or the rearing of children, sort of engaging uh, people who we might want to say are like outside of the marital relationship, but still enlisted in this work of care. Um, but we don't recognize, we may not recognize them as particular kinds of family members or as deserving of particular supports uh, that they might be due as a result of the care work that they are enlisted in. So there I sort of take myself to be making some sort of connection by saying, hey, there's a particular kind of caring relationship that exists and is not being recognized or protected and is being rendered invisible by the institution of marriage, for example. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's one, I think, connection that I'm trying to make with uh, some of the values of, uh, of care ethics. I don't know if that came through the most clearly, but um, that is sort of ways that I sort of can see uh, these projects as having some overlap. Thank you. Well, Justin, now now I want to jump in because yeah, because my questions are along those lines too. Uh, okay. So you know, uh, I mean, in part, this is just a follow up to what you said, and uh, and then an extension of Tamara's question, which is, you know, so when, when you're talking about that, uh, you know, sort of these, um, I can't remember what term she uses, but you know, kind of like intimate caregiving units or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Instead of instead of marriage, she proposes this. Uh, and uh, you know it's a it's an inelegant uh, term, uh, and it doesn't have that kind of like institutional gravitas of marriage, which you seem to be you know saying like well let's you know let's just tie this into marriage. But but you know when you start to to think about things like um, these units and and you know I, I mean I'm you know I'm it was a great presentation and I'm sympathetic to 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 the argument you're making. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I mean, I I don't know. I've sort of my my thinking is of this uh, on this all this stuff has has evolved over the years, and I you know I'm, I'm very much now at the place of like just you know the more the better. Like the more we can kind of connect people together and and provide support, you know, for that that that's great. And you know, if you could do that through marriage by extending marriage, that's good. If you could do it outside, but but you know, when you start to talk about things like uh, you know um, in black communities, you know the the neighbor who comes over, you know, twice a week to watch your kids while you have to work or, you know, things like this, um, uh, it, you know, and, and then like trying to tie that into, to like, you know, some sort of uh, marriage relationship seems, seems, uh, I don't know, at least, 
you know, less intuitive to me than just setting up programs where you recognize these, these kind of extensive open-ended caregiving networks and you say, you know, like, let's just, let's just create things whereby, you know, the, the state can provide resources and recognition for people uh, who, who have these kinds of relationships. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I guess these things aren't exclusive, right? So, so maybe this question is a little bit like, you know, uh, should, should, um, uh, you know, should should marriage recognition for for uh, polyamorous couples maybe be coupled with with these other sorts of caregiving units that you're talking about? I don't know. Are you trying to? I guess my question is for like, are you trying to wrap everything into this uh, in, in 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 maybe too much? And should there be, you know, should there still be something kind of reserved, set apart that that counts as marriage versus? other kinds of relationships i'll be quiet now <laughs> no i i appreciate that and I'll, I'll do the best that i can at like disambiguating some of the concerns that i hear you raising um and you know yeah hopefully sort of you being able to speak to that yeah. um i think that like one th one of the things that i was trying to say also to tomorrow's question is i don't think that my argument uh for uh expand marriage expansion is inconsistent with the development of these other types of institutions that might protect the kinds of caregiving relationships that maybe she has in mind. Um, I don't I don't see those as uh, sort of being inconsistent because I think that part of the reason why she takes marriage to need to be abolished is because um, it violates liberal neutrality. For me, I think that it can satisfy liberal neutrality by protecting relationships, intimate caring relationships that are presumptively permanent. I do think that that's a, a I think we can offer public reasons for that and that doesn't violate liberal neutrality. However, People, I want to also say that people want to be married. Polyamorous do want to be married, right? That this is an interest that some polyamorous do in fact have, right? And so the abolition of marriage alongside the development of these other institutions that would protect uh, these, these other caregiving relationships. My question becomes sort of like, what of sort of like the uh, those Black polyamorous who actually do want to access the institution of marriage, what might we say of those interests? Does the state constitute a harm by rendering those invisible, like you know, permanently invisible in particular kinds of ways? Um, and then also, right, like I think it's also important to sort of uh, register the, the the fact that marriage also has been associated with upholding standards of sort of like uh, purity, virginity, uh, and on the other side of that bodies that have been marked as Black, marriage has sort of been utilized as a way of making claims about their sexual practices as promiscuous or savage, so on and so forth. And this is why in the minds of many Black folks historically, sort of like after uh, the Civil War and also up into the sort of uh, the, the civil rights movement, uh, as we think of it in the 60s, um, marriage was kind of like this vehicle through which Blacks believed themselves to be able to achieve a certain kind of respectability to kind of sort of demonstrate um, like, hey, you know, we're not like these sort of sexual savage beasts, so on and so forth. Um, now, whether or not, you know, <clears throat> what do I want to say here? So I'd wonder, again, what ab abolishing sort of the institution of marriage in favor of developing these other types of institutions exclusively does to the ability for, uh, I don't know, again, Black sentient beings, Black bodies marked as Black to sort of have a particular kind of personhood recognized. Now, I'm not saying that like marriage is the only way that we might be able to do that. I think that it has a historical record of doing that in some regard. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope that that speaks to some of the, some of the concerns that, that you raise. Yeah. 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 Good. Uh, can I, can I just, you, you said something, so, so you're saying that the permanence of the relationship is, is what you're saying is, is essential for, uh, still marriage in, to, to fit with, with, uh, to, to accord with this notion of liberal neutrality that is yes. It's, it's permanent. That's that's what you're saying. Uh, and and as long as I'm, presumptively so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it may turn out that they're not in fact permanent, but yeah, the presumptive permanence I do think do, is doing some work there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Sarah. 
Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for your talk. I just think it's incredibly valuable for care ethics. I think one way um, is, yes, the legal and the politics of recognition stuff is important at a state language level, but I think epistemically and ontologically, there's so much here to value. Um, one, just to consider how both in the past within the institution of slavery, how regulating ways of relating, regulating marriage, regulating love was one way to enable the theft of caring labor, right? So defining who counts as a family, who doesn't, whose labor can be stolen, a big part of that puzzle was like regulating who you can love and who you can be married to and who you can be with. Um, and then I think, I, I, and I wonder in your research if you've had the um, opportunity to explore stories of like Black Muslims and the heritage around um, polyamory and non-monogamy in that context. So I wonder when we're just considering race, um, what role would like gendered Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism also play in um, kind of like the white supremacist narratives around polyamory and non-monogamy, so that's one wonder of mine and about your work and its value. And the second point is the epistemic value. So much of our heritage of how we care, how we know of care, how we come to care for others in our family histories um, includes polyamorous relationships, non-monogamous relationships, for example, in my family um, with my great-grandmother, great-grandfather. And that's a big part of how we understand care, the unequal ways of distributing caring labor, labor questions of gender justice. So much of that puzzle and story I wouldn't be able to bring into the care ethics world because of that white supremacist shaming and invisibilizing and erasing of these experiences. So I think epistemically is valuable, valuable because it's part of our heritage, it's part of uh, our practices of relating in different ways outside of heteronormative coupling. So I just think there's so much value here. And I think you like communicated it so powerfully and um, with so much clarity. And I think it's important. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Um... I want to like return. So I want to say I have not sort of straightforwardly in my reading uh, considered sort of like uh, the history of sort of non-monogamous relationships among Black Muslims. Um, and I, I'd like to. So if you have like recommendations or suggestions uh, where I should start, I'm happy to take those. Um, I have thought about sort of like you talk about the theft. Could you make out the, the point about the theft of uh, care labor a little bit more clearly for me? I was it sounded like a really interesting point. Um, and my mind was there before moving on to the next point, but it didn't get to ruminate there as much as I would have wanted it to. So um, can we can we kind of think, uh, could you kind of repitch that to me? Yeah, it's kind of blurring my head too, and I'm trying to be clear as possible, but I think the way settler colonialism and white supremacy work together to kind of regulate how we love, who we love, and who we're allowed to, and the loves that we're allowed to live, right? Yeah, um, yeah. By limiting that scope so much to specific form to turn people into property, right? As yes. part, part of the institution of slavery, you need to regulate, surveil, and separate families. That violence of breaking a family, a part of that story is the breaking of non-monogamous families and polyamorous yes, okay. relationships. Yes. And to like, yes, yeah, so that's it, yeah. Okay, cool, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that insight is, is what I have to say to that. Thank you for that. I agree. Yeah. I think that the work of, I think that the work of Kim Tallbear uh, in my reading does a really good job of sort of like uh, outlining that um, it, she's an indigenous scholar, but I definitely want to sort of think about sort of like, yeah, black, black Muslim history and thinking about the ways that that, yeah. So thank you. Yes, uh, uh, other questions? May I ask a, a question? I can't find the hand raised quick enough. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, th thank, no th thank you so much, Professor Clark. You really appreciated it, especially the, the history here. I grew up in a large sea conservative home in rural Oxfordshire, so I was doomed from the start for ever encountering <laughs> this. So, so thank you very much. Um, I'm really interested in this concept of minimal marriage. Um, and the, uh, there's a few questions there. I don't want to go through all of them just in case I talk over somebody else, but perhaps maybe uh, would you mind uh, elucidating on the meaning of this concept a bit more, especially when you at the start were talking about liberal marriage and the differences between those. Uh, and then if there's time I can uh, go off some of the, those answers. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the idea um, is that uh, 
minimal marriage. So I think some of the features that I tried to discuss, right, is right now marriage, right, contains uh, a set of rights, bundles, benefits, and privileges that are that are related to. Oh, sorry. I thought that was a question for me. Um, that are related to uh, uh, things like immigration law, uh, uh, bereavement leave, uh, like hospital and prison visitation, uh, sort of, uh, you know, inheritance rights, you know, how uh, capital property and these sorts of things sort of get passed on, so on and so forth. Um, and presently, there's sort of this bundle that's like all contained and shared with one person at one time, right? Uh, one feature of minimal marriage that sort of like distinguishes it from the present state of liberal marriage, uh, because it's not that, I don't think that uh, minimal marriage is illiberal or anything like that. I, I kind of want to say that. Um, but the present state of sort of uh, liberal marriage uh, is that one, it disaggregates that bundle, right, uh, in, in ways that um, uh, can be shared with more than one or throughout more than one caring relationship of a particular kind at a time. Um, and sort of break notes that, you know, at least 1,100 and I believe 92 statutes uh, in American uh, law, for example, uh, make reference to one's marital status. And so marriage sort of supervenes on, one, on one's ability to be able to uh, access those promises that the liberal state sort of reserves for uh, families of, um, uh, uh, yeah, for, for monogamous families. Um, and these things are sort of like really, really important because they have sort of, I think, tangible consequences. So, uh, for example, in New York uh, late last year, uh, a, a polyamorous family was be being in evicted in New York because of the ways that the rental laws had been written that, you know, non-related family can only be here for a certain period of time. And they were saying, OK, well, you guys aren't related. You have to go. Right. And their argument was, no, we are related. Right. And so we're talking here about a thoroughgoing establishment of a caring relationship, again, being disrupted still by the hand of the state because of this failed recognition. Um, not only that, uh, in California, a few years back, three men uh, fought uh, for and won. Um, their, this fight to have all three of their names uh, enlisted on their child's birth certificate, right? And so the ability to sort of protect themselves as caregivers, for example, of this child, although their relationship is non-dyadic, I think is something that is also important um, and, and should be allowed by the institution of marriage. Um, and there, there are a couple of other examples of things like, you know, uh, workplace discrimination or... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I could go on, I think, but I do think that the, I think that's kind of how it differs uh, a little bit is that disaggregation point, for example, um, you know, healthcare, right? I might find myself in one relationship where, I don't know, a partner of mine doesn't have a comprehensive healthcare package, and I could share that healthcare package, for example, um, with that partner whilst, right, uh, reserving another, uh, say, privilege, right, or benefit maybe around immigration to a partner that I might have who is, you know, um, uh, uh, sorry, and like a, uh, what was it? Oh, sorry, uh, to, to a partner who is like a non-American citizen, or for example, right, thinking about citizenship and protecting the caring relationship in that context that would have been established, for example, um, you know, and I, and I've, I've personally have found myself in these situations, you know, uh, a partner of mine uh, from South Africa, right? And sort of and during the Trump administration where uh, students were being threatened to be deported, you know, uh, back to their countries and things like this, uh, you know, that became a very real conversation for us. Like, okay, should we think about utilizing this institution to protect not only, you know, your ability to stay here in this country, but also protect this caring relationship that we've established, right? But if we are to enlist ourselves in that process and are already non-monogamous, if I were to take on another partner, I'd be in a lot of ways perpetuating a material disadvantage or asymmetry, even amongst my own non-monogamous relationship, right? Um, and I think that sort of this ability to disaggregate the bundle of rights, privileges, and benefits allows us to improve upon uh, that practice of, I think, uh, pernicious in, uh, exclusion. Does that does that help? 
Yeah, fantastic. Perfect sense. Thank you so much. Um, and I, w I wondered just in how minimal it goes and whether it accounts for variations of different types of relations within a polyamorous um, mm -hmm. set. So I know uh, some of my colleagues have primaries, uh, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, how do, does that fit into this concept of minimal marriage? Are there some within that broader set of relations where they're not necessarily, uh, well, they, whether they were primaries or, or not. I, I don't know if I'm uh, speaking properly there, but. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of questions there. So first is like, how minimal does it go? Um, I think that it will go as minimal as we can offer public reasons for the things that we want it to include. Um, and thinking through, again, the aim of, the, uh, of that like law, uh, of protecting particular kinds of caring relationships, I think it would include as many of those as we could justify. Um, what that looks like numerically right now, I don't know. I haven't like run the calculus or anything like that. I um, mean, ideally, I mean, so the, the second question about like primaries and hierarchical relationships, I think is a good one because of the ways it touches upon the gender dynamics that non-monogamies have historically taken on, for example. Uh, many people in lay conversation confuse polyamory with polygamy, for example, right? Um, and even by saying polygamy, which means multiple spouses and makes no gender designation, are confusing that with polygyny, which is literally the practice of one man having multiple wives, as opposed to polyandry, which is one wife having multiple husbands, right? So there are these other like uh, uh, linguistic bits that make these gender dynamics. And people will say, you know, historically polygamies have been one man, multiple wives. We have to think about the asymmetries that are created there and like sort of women's oppression and, and, and how it might get exploited, uh, women's labor might get exploited under these dynamics. Um, but I don't think that sort of, in thinking about my ethics of polyamory, which is I think a separate kind of conversation, I do think that there are reasons to resist both hierarchical polyamories and ones that might be fixed uh, along gendered lines in particular sorts of ways, right? Um, and I talk about that in some of my previous work on non-monogamy, so I won't necessarily rehash a lot of that here. Um, yeah, and yeah, I don't know. I, I do think that minimal marriage would cover those relationships, but I mean, I think we can have a separate conversation about whether or not those are, uh, the best ways to exist in non-monogamous relationships. Um, yeah, I can say that, yeah. Yeah, th thank you so much. I'll take a step back. Thank you for that. Hey, Justin, can I, can I ask you to just expound a little bit more on something you, you just said uh, uh, at the end of, of your response to, to um, the first question by Tom there, uh, when you were talking about the, you know, the, the advantage of being able to disaggregate these bundled rights, uh, um, and, and you were talking about, so in your experience uh, that, that there were, you were saying there was some kind of advantage in, in being able to, to separate out rights related to uh, um, that you might be able to bestow upon a, uh, a partner, uh, you know, uh, immigration rights for that, that you, but you wouldn't want to, to grant other sorts of rights. Uh, could you explain that? Because I mean, this is something that, that I, I guess with with Brake's work on minimal, minimal marriage, I've, I've sort of stumbled over, uh, you know, this idea of uh, of kind of being able instead of treating marriage as a bun bundled rights, right? You get a you sort of have now just this, you know, whatever a, a list like, of a, like a list, yeah, yeah, and you get to go through and you know with each each of your partners, you kind of check off, you know, well I'll give you these seventeen, and you're going to get you know uh, these you know these ninety five. Uh, it just seems very <laughs> and and actually. Um, uh, kind of a recipe for strife in a relationship. I mean, you know, I, it, it seems like there's maybe, you know, the, the way that, that rights are bundled uh, with marriage right now, you know, might be somewhat excessive, but, but I, but I want, you know, it seems like there might be some reasons, right, to, to have those, those things, especially if one of the points of, you know, of marriage is maybe to facilitate the ability of people to have to have this relationship and to sustain this relationship and to be able to care for each mm -hmm. other. And especially if you start to separate these things out, you know, something happens down the line, you don't realize, 
you know, you've separated out your healthcare rights from your, you know, some other rights, and then, you know, there's, there's sort of a conflict. Um, so I, 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 I just like to hear a little bit more about why, why you think that's a good idea, as opposed to just, just, you know, you could just say, look, uh, you know, um, we're just going to give, we're just going to extend the, you know, this bundles of rights to, to, you know, to, ah. you know, I see. Yeah. Just, just, you, you're all, you, have, you know, if you have, if you have a polyamorous, you know, polyamorous, uh, we're going to recognize it and, you know, all, whatever, all four partners, you know, get up, get all the rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Actually, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and I, I think that some of the first remarks that come to my head are not very philosophical, like, I, I guess, not as philosophical as they are pragmatic. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I, I would want to think about that some more, Dan. I mean, I think, you know, at first blush, um, you know, I'm like where, you know, whether or not it would be economically feasible. Uh, uh, but then I'm just like, you know, but we're doing philosophy, you know, the heck with economic feasibility, you know. Uh, and so, the, you know, I am sort of more drawn to uh, that possibility. And I anticipate an objection coming from somewhere saying like, you know, well, at this point, you know, we can't just keep uh, enumerating these rights ad infinitum, right? Uh, but I think that that worry also goes away by making appeals to just human limitation on the kinds and amounts of caring relationships we might be able to have uh, mm -hmm. uh, just sort of like in general. Right. And so I don't know. I, I want to think a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. John. Justin, thank you for this wonderful talk. It was really, really uh, thought-provoking and uh, eye-opening. I hadn't thought about the ways in which, um, I'm, you know, what I know about slavery and about families and so on, but I hadn't thought of that in the terms you presented it. It's really quite useful to think these ways. Thank you. But the last set of questions raised a couple of uh, hard questions for me. So, and I know I'm kind of sound like an old Marxist feminist here, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. Okay, so so you already mentioned the problem with, um, and I'm not a Marxist feminist, but I'll say like a minute. Um, you raised this question about the problem with hierarchy, but I think um, <clears throat> you know part of my reaction always to marriage. And I, I I've lost you, Joan. I can't hear you. The way to distribute benefits to people is not through marriage, but through giving everyone the rights. Sure. And now here's the, I see a pro, two problems with this. One, and this goes back to, to the, my concerns about neoliberalism, my deep concerns about neoliberalism. One of the things that happens in neoliberalism is that the path and the roles of responsibility move ever closer, always fall down, right? It's always about the state and rich people turning off responsibility and saying, take care of it yourself. Mm. And this is true in institutions. It's true in institutions like, um, you know, when there's a, um, a new committee to create greater equity in the hospital, guess who ends up doing all the work on the equity committee? You mm. know, the black and brown and women who are interested in these questions who happen to work in that hospital. Mm -hmm. And this happens over and over again, right? You drop this, I mean, they say they're taking responsibility on, but in fact, they pass it on down. Mm -hmm. So by creating polyamorous relationships, what you're really saying is, look, most of social benefits in our liberal society, and we like it this way, are distributed through marriage. So you don't have enough money? Well, too bad for you find yourself a family. Oh, all the good men are taken? No, they're not. Uh, join a family that already exists. So the, the idea that this will just push the burdens of being poor, being disadvantaged, even further down into each individual can now make a much more complicated choice. 
not only can you decide to get married, but now you can decide to join some polyamorous group. And if you haven't done that, then you must be just a complete and total loser and society shouldn't support you anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? That, that's what that's my my worry, that you're just pushing responsibility down. Okay. In an ideal society where we didn't have this value system sitting over us, this sounds actually really nice, but there's that concern. The second concern goes the other way. And if you will let me put it this way, I love this concern with tenderness. You've talked about it before, and I just think it's a really interesting way of thinking, much better than compassion, you know, uh, to think of civic tenderness. (sighs) But without civic tenderness, in the first place, to create polyamorous relations as a way to get to tenderness isn't going to work. Because the presumption will be on the part of people who don't think kindly towards others, that polyamorous relations are simply a way to take more benefits, to be more greedy. So, okay, you the spouse you're married to is a citizen but doesn't have health rights, so you give that person uh, health care. But you have another person who you're really close to, who's really a person you love, and you want to give that person migration rights. In other words, you're getting more than your share of rights to distribute around because you happen to be taking on other spouses. Mm. You can see already the argument this is going to create about, well, these relationships weren't like that before. They're insincere relations made up by these kinds of uh, how shall we put, what would they say? They would say, these predatory polyamorous groups going around, sucking up all the rights. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I worry, I worry, so I worry about that kind of thinking. Sure. Um, so as always, John, so much good there. Um, uh, in regards to the not giving everyone sort of like the rights, I guess I I, I do want to think more poignantly, I guess, because it, it's come up, I think, and I think this question has come up maybe like in a couple of different ways, maybe three times, uh, even, even in this conversation, and that is sort of um, whether or not minimal marriage is inconsistent with the development of other institutions that might also need to be developed to support caring relationships in their own right. I don't presently conceive of it as being inconsistent with that. I want to think more about that because it seems to be something that I'm being pressed on. And I don't know if for now, I'm just not appreciating the um, the perceived incompatibility. But as with most things in my thinking, usually when I spend more time reflecting on them, uh, clarity emerges. So I'll, 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 I want to sort of think more about that because I, I don't think that in saying like, yes, minimal marriage, don't do anything else about other caring relationships that perhaps are being marginalized or don't do anything else about people who are, you know, existing in poverty, so on and so forth. Um, You know, and I don't necessarily know if I conceive of marriage as some black thinkers have historically uh, as a way of like rectifying poverty. I don't know if that's what it's the kind of, I, I know it plays a role in sort of creating and sustaining it. Right. And I'm wondering if this disaggregation bit, you know, kind of levels that playing field just a little bit more. Um, but I do want to think more about this compatibility point. So I, I want to say that. Um, I think that the second point is super, uh, I love it because it's, it's, it's sort of saying like, look, people are already civically indifferent to polyamories that exist presently and have existed historically. And that is why they might conceive of themselves or conceive of others as creating these relationships as opposed to just recognizing them as something that already exists, deserving of rights, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, given the fact that I'm focusing on Black polyamorous and stuff like this, I've been reading a lot of like Afro pessimists like David Marriott and uh, uh, Frank Wilderson, and they, they don't uh, have you know, a lot of space in there theorizing for hopefulness and things like this. Uh, And so for me, like, you know, I'm inclined uh, to say, you know, oh, you know, I I guess I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say like, oh, well, there's hope on the horizon because of these empirics, right? So for example, um, you know, I I believe in a, I want to say a 2017 paper, 
um, it, it, it's coming from psychology uh, and not necessarily philosophy, but uh, it's tracking the ways uh, that people have been exposed to uh, things like consensual non-monogamous relationships, polyamories, uh, polyamorous as a word, as a language, where they're encountering it. And we are seeing that the awareness of the term, the awareness of this love style is on the on the rise, at least in the American context. And they've been tracking that uh, by also kind of saying like, you know, where have you been encountering it? And so people have been saying like media and things like this. And so there does seem to be an increase maybe since 2015 after same-sex marriage gets legalized and we start to see certain forms of media and the ways that it's disseminated start to change around love and relationships, right? It wasn't super radical. It didn't change a whole lot, but you know, some things did start to change by way of like who we're able to present on TV uh, and, and what the public might uh, uh, receive as more palatable. Um, so these numbers are on the rise around like polyamories and consensual non-monogamous relationships. And then in 2020 and in 2021, two cities in Massachusetts, Somerville, Massachusetts, as well as Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, uh, extended their institution of marriage at the local level to include uh, uh, pluralistic unions. So they, they extended the rights typically reserved for spouses in a marriage uh, to group unions, right? And then there's the case of the New York folks getting evicted and sort of the three men on the, the birth certificate. And so when I think about those sorts of things, um, I guess I'm inclined to look at that as sort of like, you know, some recognition, at least seemingly more recognition around these kinds of caring relationships are being acknowledged. How and where that tenderization is happening is something that I want to sort of look into because I want to say, hey, well, if there's a model here, right, perhaps this is, uh, perhaps there's uh, like a blueprint, right, that I could sort of, uh, that we could sort of think about uh, uh, by way of sort of presenting these caring relationships in ways that might, again, tenderize a, a, a larger, larger swaths of society, so on and so forth. Um, now, whether that does anything to combat like those who are just so calloused and so indifferent, I don't know. Um, I don't think that it does, uh, sadly. Um, I don't think that it does. But I, I, again, even along racial lines, I don't think I have the space to be even hopeful that those callous to those, those presently and persistently unable to make those kinds of recognitions. Um, and this is where the Afro-pessimism comes in, right? I, 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 it's hard to remain hopeful of the possibility that people that calloused um, might see the light of day or, you know, might see the light at the end of the day, I mean, I don't know. I, my thinking about tenderness and its, you know, transformative power was, you know, was dealt a big hit during the Trump years, man. And and if I'm if I'm being honest about that, uh, things that I thought were possible, things that I was once hopeful about, um, they just were dealt a big hit. So I, I appreciate the question. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I and I want to think more about that. Thanks a lot. Okay, yeah. uh, let's see. We have a few more minutes. There are last questions. Somebody want to get a last question, observation in there? I might. Okay. Uh, Oh, yeah, go ahead, Eva. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to echo everybody's um, <clears throat> um, praise of uh, you bringing these issues to um, light and to bring to light in the way in which you're doing. Um, I do want to say that, uh, you know, one place to look for some of that tenderization um, uh, is of course in in these uh, various surrogate relationships that uh, get created with uh, gay couples um, mm. having children, mm. um, and more more acceptance of that. Um, you know, we have magazine articles being written about it and so forth. But another place is in the area of aging. Mm. Um, 
and you hear more and more stories and articles and uh, about you know um, uh, couples who have divorced, um, and one one party gets sick and uh, they. Uh, they may be married to another person, but the uh, divorce party comes in mm -hmm. to help take care of the person, mm -hmm. uh, even if the person is married to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and the kind of uh, the, the kind of vulnerabilities that come through uh, the extents of aging, um, uh, which is you know. Uh, more and more evident, I think, in, in the population. And that, that may also be a, an area where you can see some of that tenderization, perhaps. Thank you, Eva. I have written both of those down. Um, and yeah, I, I, I will look into those, uh, especially because I think the argument can be made that these are very easily non-monogamous dynamics. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's, it's very straightforward. I, I, I love those suggestions. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. Um, Carol Levine has written a lot on care, caregiving. Um, she has a wonderful expression, which is that family are those who are there for the long run. Um, and uh, uh, that's just a phrase that uh, okay. I was reminded of when you talked about the presumptive permanence and the importance of presumptive permanence. It's the being there in the long run. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, Justin, I wanna thank you. That was that was really great. That was, uh, uh, you know, uh, as everyone has has mentioned, it was a really, uh, you know, I mean, for me too, I learned a lot from your talk, uh, uh, very engaging. Um, you know, I, I probably talked too much, but but I, I you know I, your your work's great, uh, and um, so so thank you, thank you for that talk. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much for having me, uh, you all, and I think for those of you all who are interested in my thinking about the ethical dimensions of non-monogamy, I do have a book coming out in March with Rutledge that I'd like to sort of put on you all's radar, uh, make you aware of, called "Why It's Okay to Not Be Monogamous." Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so that'll be out March 27th. So yeah, feel free to, you know, dabble if you'd like. Well, and uh, I hope I hope you'll uh, join us for some of these sessions later in the semester and then you can you can announce it as well. Uh, Absolutely. To remind us all when it comes out. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So so thank you all. Our next session will be on uh, the 24th of February, James Thompson. Uh, aesthetics of care, uh, and um, I, I will. I have an article to send out, and also a link to an edited book. Uh, but uh, he's going to start uh, his talk. He's going to talk about the the article that I'll that I'll send out uh, in advance of the talk. The, um, I think it's called just the aesthetics of care, something like that. Uh, and so and so he'll ground his talk in that. But then he's also he leads uh, at um, uh, University of Manchester uh, um, an aesthetics of care program. So so I think he's going to talk about this specific work and then kind of expand out a little bit to to talk about this larger project uh, that he's engaged in. So I hope to see you all on the twenty fourth of February. Until then, uh, be well, um, uh, stay healthy, and and uh, do good things. So we'll see you, <laughs> see you in a month. Uh, good to see you all. Thank you. Thanks, Justin.